Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to tonight's Meet the Poet event. Uh, I'm Flori. I'm the host for this evening, and I'm really delighted to have two such fantastic poets with us tonight. Uh, Sarah Law and Sarah Stewart will be reading us through their poetry, um, and there'll be plenty of time for you to ask any questions you may have. So welcome to our two poets. It's great to have you here this evening. Um, let's do just a quick introduction for both of you. Um, so Sarah Law, um, can you give us a little wave so we know which That's one That's me. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Sarah Law is a poet, critic and fiction writer and an associate lecturer with the Open University. Uh, she also edits the Amethyst Review, um, which is an online journal that publishes new writing for considerations of spirituality and the sacred. So welcome. It's good to have you here this evening. Thank you. Delighted to be here. And our second speaker, Sarah Stewart. Um, Sarah is currently the director of the Lighthouse Literary Consultancy, and she runs various creative writing and poetry workshops for adults and children. Um, she's worked as fiction editor at Scholastic Children's Books, and she was senior editor at Florist Books. So welcome to you both. Um, before we begin, I would just like to say, if you're interested, anyone who's watching at home, interested in these events that we're doing, then there's a link below in the description to sign up to be notified about all future poetry events that we're gonna be running. Um, so do please sign up and then you'll never miss a single one. Um, so yes, let's get started. Um, before we delve into each of your poetry individually, I thought it might be nice to ask a couple of questions together. Um, so I wondered if we could hear a little bit from each of you about your your poetry journey, I guess, from where you started writing poetry to where you are now, both published poets. Um, so Sarah Law, would you like to go first? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Well, it's a great question. I, I, I'm not sure I have um, a completely coherent answer, but um, <laughs> I, I suppose I've always written, I've always written poems. Um, even as a child, I've always really enjoyed just sort of writing little things in notebooks and writing stories and writing poems. And um, and it just carried on. Um, I, I um, did English Lit at university and then went on and did not in poetry uh, some poetry came into it but um, I've always just enjoyed writing on the side I do try and write other things as well <laughs> occasional bit of fiction so yeah I always come back to poetry mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's strange actually this last strange 12 months we've had um, I've just felt drawn back to it again as much as ever I think it's the really? the short compressed form of it uh, as, as feels like it's kind of kept me relatively sane in a way yeah so it's, it's an ongoing <laughs> ongoing passion yeah yeah, I know some people, some people have got even more into it during all of this. Some people have lost it a bit. So it's nice to hear that you're still very much ongoing with it. Still going. Perfect. And Sarah Stewart. Well, I'm envious of Sarah Law that she's been writing a lot of poems recently because I haven't really <laughs> in the last year. I really haven't. Um, I came to poetry quite late. I did uh, an English Lit degree as well. And then I, I didn't start writing poetry until I was in my late 20s. I sort of went to an evening class at the poetry school in London, um, which is such a great resource. Right. Yeah. yeah, sort of did it as a bit of a retreat from my stressful job at the time, and then mm -hmm. fell in love with it. And I ended up going to to do a master's in poetry at St Andrews, and mm -hmm. it kind of brought me back to Scotland, which which mm -hmm. has been. I just finished a PhD again in poetry at Edinburgh, so it it became a huge fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear. It's, it's interesting that you've got kind of different stories as well that you've yeah. approached at different times, but you're still very, very yeah. much interested. Yeah, uh, I'd say um, to Sarah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be envious. I'm not saying any of the poetry I've been writing recently <laughs> is any good. <laughs> it's, it's more the process. It's mm. more the process and not worrying too much about the <laughs> the quality of the output. Sometimes it is. It just feels like a thing to do that one needs to do. Yeah. It's admirable yeah. to even be picking up a pen. Really, like that's very impressive. So, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um and obviously you know you've both you both seem like very busy people very busy jobs yeah. um where do you find the time I mean you know you've varied over Covid but where have you found the time to sort of write poetry in general and do you have a particular process when you go about it you know do you start it in a certain way or just write whenever it comes to you shall I go first I, I I'd say yeah, let, yeah, um a, a little a little bit of uh, various approaches I'd say in a way um, I've been deprived and I think 
so many writers have because writing on trains is is wonderful to do mm. I do like doing that writing in cafes mm. wonderful too those those kind of serendipitous little uh, fragments of peace and and kind of comfortable solitude that you can have in the day that's all gone um for now um mm. so I'm often just trying to write something um most days I won't say every day but most days and sometimes that's early uh early on so I've I've done something I've got some ideas down and notes down um but even if I've had a day where I've either been too busy or I just haven't had the creative energy to do it I do try and get something down even if it is just uh literally at the end of the day sitting in bed with a mm -hmm. cup of tea <laughs> um yeah. and then I can assess the quality the next day but something mm -hmm. about just keeping the momentum going often it is on those liminal edges of the day sort of the begin yeah. very beginning or the very end uh, but that's just me and that that's kind of my ongoing um uh, kind of pandemic <laughs> continuation strategy yeah. <laughs> if you like yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. For, for, for me i feel like it's quite um liminal is a good word it's kind of snatch yeah. time here and there and yeah. i think that lends mm -hmm. itself that one poetry like I'm working on a novel at the moment and that seems to require sort of longer blocks of concentration. Yeah. But I still, I, it's fine, I know what you mean about trains. I maintain that like I had one of my best poem ideas when I was coming out of Asda yeah. and waiting to cross the road with like carrying shopping. And it's just like mm -hmm. in movement and flux and these yeah. odd moments sometimes yeah. they pop up. So it's, it's quite haphazard for me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's what poetry is, really. It can't really be, you can't confine it or, you know, decide at this hour of the day, I'll produce an excellent poem. It's just, a, it's about what happens when it happens. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a combination, isn't it, of, of showing up with, with a certain amount of regularity and not necessarily expecting uh, wonderful ideas to strike, but and also being aware of when when some when you do see something or hear something or something just comes together um uh, being aware that that has potential and and, yeah, and then finding the time to develop yeah. it uh, um well before we delve into each of your your works i have one more question um are either of you reading any particular poetry at the moment or just have a general poetry recommendation that you could give to our viewers at home anything inspiring oh, wow. stuff um i have a quick one if that's all right um yeah my friend isabel gallimore is a wonderful poet she has a collection mm -hmm. out um i think it was with carcanet called significant other and she's really an interesting poet so I, I want to wave the flag for her and suggest that you have a read of her it's really definitely mm. Mm -hmm. oh that's great um i can't think of a single collection off the top of my head I mean I sort of have new favorites <laughs> all mm -hmm. the time but um I'll say I mean the last two presses that I've worked with that have wonderful poetry and Broken Sleep is mm -hmm. a fantastic publisher mm -hmm. of new pamphlets and collections and you know um everything's good <laughs> really good yeah. quality and interesting new stuff um mm -hmm. and my latest full-length collection is with um, a US publisher called Paraclete um, and they look specifically at um, more spiritually inspired poetry um, but it's just really interesting there's so many different literary approaches and that the whole list together is just a wonderful conversation you can get lost in um, so there's a couple of starting places and Amethyst Review <laughs> yes yes of course yes. online and free <laughs> yeah <laughs> great okay well I think it's about time that we hear some of the work so let's start with Sarah Law um, so first up, we're going to be hearing a couple of your poems from uh, My Converted Father, which is the Poetry Book Society selected pamphlet. Um, so can you tell me a bit of, I mean, what was the inspiration behind this pamphlet? Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, no, it's, yes, that's right. So, um, yeah, so that came out in 2018. And um, in, in spite of its title and in spite of my my sort of recent swerve into, into the life of a... Um, a French 19th century nun and writing about her um, it's yeah. not really about religion it's it's more about my father actually mm -hmm. um so the phrase the phrase actually um comes from a different poem <laughs> um mm -hmm. that I had written a while ago but it just stuck in my head as my converted father and um from somewhere I I, I suppose I was thinking about my dad I mean we lost him uh, you know a long, long time ago over a decade ago now but I was thinking about him and the phrase just 
kind of appeared in my mind and I wanted to just write about him, write some memoirs and have a kind of imaginary discourse with him. And um, I, I suppose you could say, I mean, I haven't converted him to any sort of <laughs> spiritual life, but I suppose I've converted him into poetry in a way. Mm. Um, I just I just had the idea of some small little vignettes. And at the time I was playing with language, I was playing with a prose poem, although these haven't ended up as prose poems, but they they quite a few of them started life um, as kind of mm -hmm. little snapshots, little snapshots of memory. Um, and onto that, I tried to layer this idea of me remembering and my father it, it, in the present tense also remembering. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I tried to play with those ideas of, of kind of presence and absence, um, mm -hmm. plus all the little specifics and and uh, you know little details that that make up the um the memories of of, uh, of someone's life so that's how it came mm -hmm. about yeah i mean snapshots yeah. develop into a bigger picture don't they um yeah. it's always it's interesting yeah. as well hearing you know at what stage the title comes it sounds like the title was very important for you for the the for this one, yes, for this mm. one, the title um, kind of st stood up and walked out of, a, as I said, a poem that I'd written earlier mm. about something else entirely. And it just kind of presented itself as the title for a kind of, uh, yeah, poetic um, yeah. little mini album, as you say. And, and yeah. these, these memories kind of came onto the page and I, and I worked then with them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'd love to hear you read one. Um, the first poem we've got up is Mort's. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? Um, uh, it started with uh, the memory of my uh, my dad, who was a, a radio ham. He was he worked in kind of electronic broadcast engineering all his life, so he he loved things like that. Uh, he loved radio amateurs. He loved Morse code, and um, uh, and I I I, um, I used to learn it. I learned it when I was school girl just because it was fun. <laughs> you know, it was a fun yeah. thing to do. Um, yeah. And 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 then it started me thinking about communication, I suppose, on a more abstract level. Um, but not 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 too heavy, just a sort of light mm -hmm. idea about communication and and how our memories are um, they kind of live through the act of communication in a way. Yeah. yeah. Not not it wasn't supposed to be too heavy though. Okay, <laughs> Shall well, I read over it? to you then. Yeah, over to you. I will read it. Mm -hmm. So this is Morse. My converted father rings in my ear. It's Morse at a 15 kilohertz pitch. I hope you're keeping a log, he advises. I catch his aside, but can't translate the message. Can't tune into your station. I'll keep trying. I'm signaling from all over the world, he says. I got my license lifetimes ago. I still know bits of the code. We would test each other. I had a little notebook, and when I waited outside the school gates, I'd peruse it, all the dots and dashes, dips and dars. More for the fun of learning something than deciphering its meaning. Yes, that's so often the case, he agrees. Now I'm converted into pure medium. That's fab. I know you said it was meant to be sort of quite lighthearted, but I think it's it's very beautifully the, rich. The feelings, yeah, the feelings come through, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah the sort of daughter feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd just like to um, take a moment to remind people who are watching online that if you want to leave any questions, then you can do so on um, the YouTube and Facebook chat functions. And we'll try to do as many as we can um, throughout the hour. But apologies if we can't get through them all, um, but we will try. Um, but yes, should we go on to the next poem? The next one is um, Tai Chi. It's from the same yeah. pamphlet, isn't it? It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Tai Chi. It's not a faith, you'd say. It's a martial art. Morning after morning, you'd be out on the patio, enacting your battle with enemy seconds. Every time you held the pose, white crane spreads wings. Eternity feathered your court form. As with any battle, you remind me, impetus, resistance, comes from within. All this is a far cry from a puff of cloud, you add. A man must put his foot down eventually. That's fantastic. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, because as you said, you know, this is a slightly different uh, collection to some of your other things. 
Um, and is there a is there do you have a preference between the two between writing about this this feels very personal and it's about your family as opposed to your later stuff where you know you're writing about Therese and these historical figures do you prefer one style over the other? Mm. Uh, at the time of writing, yes, but I I don't I'm not a sort of pinned down I don't want to be a pinned down poet. So I think it's probably important to have a little bit of both, really. You know, that the subjects that seem to be personal and intimate. Um, as I was writing them and sort of revising them as poems, I was interested in the 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 not just the craft craft as much as you have with free verse but that the kind of bigger ideas about communication and memory behind it um and then on the other hand when I was writing about Therese about this 19th century nun um uh, there's something about her that that captures at the heart and I suppose I have some personal connection with her and part of the um part of the compulsion to write I think is to find out exactly what that personal connection is <laughs> um mm. and I, I don't always know myself why I'm why I'm drawn to subjects um, either people or places or events or, or clusters of words um, but I think there has to be a personal connection on some level yeah um, yeah whether it's you know obvious and overt or whether it's a bit of a subtext um, between the poet and their subject I think it has yeah. to still be there yeah definitely I completely agree um, I think should we go on to the next poem I think this is we're now going to be moving on to um, your collection Therese poems um, and yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of writing this collection as a whole? And you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so for those who don't know, and there's no real reason why people should know, but um, Saint Therese uh, of Lisieux was a 19th century French nun. Um, and ostensibly she lived a very short, very compressed, shut away life she died at the age of 24 which just seems in inconceivable um mm. uh, having been a nun for nearly 10 years she was a nun for nine years she became a nun when she was 15 so the otherness of her story is is really quite something um and i mean if you have a catholic background you're perhaps brought up to to recognize her or recognize pastor saint in the church and I, I didn't have that background actually I don't particularly come from that angle I, I'm just caught by something about her and I have been for a long time I sort of read about this small compressed life that seems to be full of something you know full of feeling um full of mystery full of love full of a kind of full of a kind of absence that, that seems uh, very compelling um and before I go off onto too many abstracts I should say <laughs> one of the, the the concrete things that started this this collection uh, was looking looking actually at the wonderful photographs that exist um, of this otherwise very obscure figure. So the 19th century portrait photography existed, but it was still in its infancy um, in a way. Um, so uh, photographs could be taken and, and, and there were amateur photographers, um, but the whole process was uh, fairly laborious. Um, and there are, I think, 47 photographs of Therese mm -hmm. taken throughout her whole life and in, that includes two after she died as well so compared with our our kind of social media you yeah. know 100, 100 photographs a week um, yeah. kind of culture. again it's something something very different but looking mm -hmm. at those photographs something about them really drew me to it so there was something about responding to the visual and to that sense of connection to um, such a different life such a short life through such a long time ago you know 19th century she died before the start of the 20th century um mm -hmm. so something about those photographs which are wonderful and they are available online um really had me reflecting um so so uh, a, a blend of of kind of personal interest and kind of aesthetic interest and then thinking about the the person behind them um mm -hmm. uh, something about those 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 things created the right um kind of conditions for me to want to write poems and that's that's probably the the, the best way I can say it. Yeah, um, no, that's so, so very, yeah. very well. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. take it away then. I think the first one is photo for April eighteen eighty eight. Yes. Yeah, so um, a little bit of background on this one. Uh, my my collection is a, a kind of biography. I'm I'm 
slightly hesitant to use the word because of course there's lots I've left out and my facts aren't a hundred percent um and so on but I have a kind of chronological approach I look at her life at her short life um and the first one is just before she enters this convent this enclosed convent um mm-hmm. where she's felt called for for many years and there's one portrait photo of her um, which is actually on the cover of the the book yeah. as well um yeah. so in that one I'm, I'm just wondering what she's thinking about about her life to come so um okay. i'll read it so it's just called photo, photo four april 1888 madame besnier takes the portrait three short days before she enters she is 15 her tresses twined up in a bun her blue dress hugs her body in a way she will forswear her hands are demure, her face bright. Later, Céline will slim her spine with artist's gouache to an arch, tighten her image to sanctity's pattern. Like and unlike the Thérèse she knew, Thérèse herself looks straight ahead, smiling at the camera's examine and the dark veil that surrounds it. And, and, and Celine, I should say, is, is actually Teresa's sister. It's her blood sister mm-hmm. who um, took many of the later photographs and she kind of took charge of the, the visual image um, mm. of Therese. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's not something that's lost nowadays. It's still very much the case. Sisters looking after each other's sisters. Um, very, very beautifully read. Thank you. We've actually we've got a few comments coming through. Um, I might read some of them out. So um, we have... So Barbara Stewart says that um, she was really looking forward to the Morse poem. Um, her father was in the Navy and taught her Morse code. Oh, is, oh, that's nice. nice. Oh, similar, yeah. similar sort of memories. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, John, Sull- oh, John Sullivan asks um, what the name of your pamphlet was because he didn't quite catch it. That was My Converted Father, wasn't it? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tom Harrison says, it's such a delight to hear such depth and conviction by the poet. So I thank you. Obviously very enjoying your work. Um, right, let's move on to the next poem, if you'd like. Um, this is another one from Therese Poems. Um, I think this one's Snow. Can you tell us a little bit yes. about it? Um, so, Therese um, always loved snow and um, apparently when she took her vows I think that might have been her first vows I'm not sure but but it it snowed um, and Mm. she felt very personally moved by that and that um, that that just kind of that fragment of information um, I found quite moving as well so I I, I wrote about it and I wrote about um, I suppose again I was sort of thinking about how she must have, have felt It's just a short poem. So, so snow. The snow she'd always loved, delicate and white, winter blossom, heavenly host melting on the tongue, each communion unique and given freely. So she dared to pray for snow to mark her vows, prayed to be given to the cold, resolved to the filigree of soul work dissolved at the ushering of the sky's breath that was beautiful it was short it was one of those poems it's really nice to hear read aloud uh, the sounds of it were particularly lovely um i do have a question um out of the pamphlets and the collections that you've done which one would you say is your favorite if you can pick one Oh, um, well, again, that's so hard because it's mm. a, it's a common. I'm sorry. It's a common. No, it's but I mean, it allows me to, <laughs> to 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 go on a bit. But it, it, it's, it's this common trope that for poets that the um, the poem that they've written the le- you know the most recently is the best poem they've ever written because mm, <laughs> yeah. you're still buzzing with that feeling. So yeah. so um, so uh, I I in a way I'm I'm super pleased with Therese even though it, it feels like it's a niche subject um but I didn't I didn't want it to be um I, w- I wanted it to be a proper poetry collection that, that that other people interested in poetry could read so I'm 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 very 
um, I'm still very attached to it because it's the most recent to come out. Um, having said that, um, uh, my converted father, I was very pleased with as well. Mm -hmm. And I've, done, I've, you know, worked on previous books with um, di different publishers, um, Gatehouse, um, and that was wonderful. And, yeah. and then before that, a couple of collections with Shearsman, um, when I was flexing my experimental wings a little bit more. Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. I haven't I haven't shed the wings either. It's just they're, <laughs> they're just they're just resting. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. But I mean it's yeah. it's interesting what you say because Therese it's I suppose it is a niche subject but also very relatable, especially because you, you write about it so well. I think that's the beauty of how how you've written it is that someone a, a very particular person in history can still be very relatable to someone today. Um yeah. That that was the yeah that was the kind of um, challenge that I mm. was drawn to. I won't say I set myself, but that, that's what I wanted to do, and that's that's why I wanted to write in quite a simple way as well. So it wasn't a, a conscious decision in a way, but it was just that that's the way the poems insisted on being written in in, in yeah. quite a quite a simple way because it suits the subject and mm. how I wanted to approach her. Absolutely. Um, someone's just commented saying, "Beautiful poem, very evocative." So thank you. Thank you. Um, right, the next poem that we have um, is Sister St. Peter. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Would you like to explain a bit? Uh, well, I will just say that um, uh, Therese, when she became a nun, she was the youngest by far of this community of um, nuns, some of whom were on the cranky side of <laughs> <laughs> things, let's say. And um, this is this is one story um, that she wrote about herself, um, uh, about her when she was new in the convent and trying to find her feet. She, she um, was given this a delightful job of assisting an elderly somewhat cranky sister to to the refectory and, and how she mm. she seemed to have this gift even then of um well she would say doing things with love but you know do, doing doing things with a, a kind of poignancy that 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 just sticks in the memory um mm. and and those sort of things for me lend lend themselves to to poetry so it's just a, a, a little fleeting moment and i've written about it um okay. sister saint peter the elderly nun shakes her hourglass. You there, sister, let's get on with it. Therese steps up and helps the hurting limbs into a rhythm of sorts towards a refectory forever receding. She gets no thanks. She is too quick, too young. The cloister holds its breath. Somewhere in her body, music plays, the fizz of a waltz, perhaps, a ripple in the skin of life beyond its walls. The sky is inky blue. The elderly nun, seated at last, struggles with her cutlery. So Therese slices the bread and cheese and on impulse turns her face to Sister St. Peter's and leans in for a kiss. That's a beautiful, it's a beautiful message. I really like that. Um, and I will just say that the yeah. photos work, they are, they work really, really well. I feel like obviously they're quite integral to, to the poems. And it's really nice to be able to have them up on the screen. So we yeah. Can see them as well. yeah, 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 great. Um, I think we have time for just one more poem from you. And that one is Laundry. So that's um, Laundry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a, that's another example of of um, why Therese lends herself to poetry um, so well. I think, and again, it's another little moment. Um, it's not uh, ostensibly about her prayer life or anything. It's just a little moment where the nuns. I mean, there were no washing machines in those days, so mm. they all had to they all had, had to help out with the household tasks. Um, <laughs> and this is just one example of her. Um, finding a moment to um to to uh experience some some sort of grace uh, you know yeah. um, and that's that's where the poem comes from and of course the, the photograph is just wonderful um uh, definitely this, yeah this as well yeah so 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 laundry these are hard days the sodden sheets robes scapulars are scrubbed with salt and ash and now need rinsing rolling beating rinsing again in the convent's wash house pool. Every nun is needed. They jostle each other at the water's edge, grip their wooden paddles, plunge their hands into the cold. The heavy fabrics billow and contract. Their fingers burn and freeze. 
To keep their spirits up, they sing rounds and homemade verses, pummeling, ringing in rhythm. Then Sister Mary Joseph splashes Therese, her neighbour, with sour grey water. She closes her eyes too briefly to be noticed. When she opens them, they shine on Mary Joseph and her lilting hymn, the blue-white skin of the sister's wrists, the dim reflections of the pool on everything. That's a lovely note to end the collection on. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your poetry this evening. Thank um, you. It's been a real joy to hear it read aloud, particularly. Um, but yes, yeah. thank you very much. Thank um, you. And Thanks so much. We'll, we're going to bring in Sarah Stewart um, to to the stream. Hiya. Hello. 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 Good to have you back. Um, for those of you who might have come in a little bit late, um, Sarah Stewart is our second speaker for tonight. Um, and I just I had to ask you before we dive into your poems. Um, you were a UNESCO City of Literature writer in residence in Krakow in 2017. Um, what was what was that like? How was it? It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. I'm very fortunate because I live in Edinburgh and we're a UNESCO City of Literature. We are a city of literature. And there are networks mm -hmm. happening around the world. So I had the opportunity to go and, and live in Krakow for, for a month. And I was in this kind of, um, I think it was maybe a 17th century beautiful old kind of stately home i was in a kind of a uh, large building next to the stately home also beautiful and it was yeah. a very atmospheric place and one of the other writers there uh told me that she was completely convinced that the room i was staying in was haunted so oh was no oh it, was it a good thing though did it spark some writing there was some kind of story like it was haunted by a ghost butler so he didn't bring me any tea in bed or anything but um <laughs> talking about this hymn and did this kind of special chanting and rearranged the room in a way that she reckoned had settled the ghost down so yeah it was an interesting experience uh, it's a beautiful beautiful yeah. city and I, I learned yeah. only about 10 words of Polish but I had a lovely time. Oh. Sounds fantastic um yeah I just had to ask before we get going because it's such an interesting venture um yes Thank you for telling me a little bit about that. Um, and tonight you're reading mostly from your debut pamphlet, Glisk, yeah. um, which I adored. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this pamphlet won the 2019 Callum MacDonald Award um, for the publisher of the best poetry pamphlet in Scotland. Um, so can you explain to me a little bit of the thought process behind the pamphlet um, and what inspired it? I wish that I were organised enough to say there was a process behind it. <laughs> you know, with lots of other writers, things come together in a more, uh, you know, mm -hmm. piecemeal fashion, haphazard fashion. But mm -hmm. um, I, I was working on a poetry PhD at the University of Edinburgh, so it was a time when I was generating a lot of work anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this really excellent small publisher called Tapsel Tiwi, which is kind of the mm -hmm. Scottish word for topsy turvy. Mm. Um, and the publisher That's Dunham, lovely. Took a look. yeah it's a good word, yeah. good word. and then uh, yeah and lo and behold it's turned into the wee the wee pamphlet mm. it's skinny yeah um, so yeah it covers as you'll probably see when i read quite a diverse range of uh inspirations in there mm -hmm. so would you say it's sort of you know it's a collaboration of quite a, a, a long time of working yeah, I would. I actually, I am 41 now and I look back and a lot of the poems were kind of started or at least thought about maybe back in my 20s. It mm -hmm. almost feels like a catalogue of my my growing up. And, you know, there's kind yeah. of stuff that I've worked on over the years. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I've moved on to work that feels a little bit different now, but mm -hmm. a nice record to have. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so the first poem that we'll be hearing is The Arctic Arms Dundee. Um, it's a very nice sort of, um, a bit of a witty poem, I'd say. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's kind of a riff on a true story. So the poem is loosely based on something that did happen to my parents in 1978. And I was told the story, um, it, it really surprised me as a woman living in uh, our times. It astonished me to hear that there were, well, I don't want to give away the entire poem. It essentially mm. that you couldn't buy a pint in some pubs as a woman back in the yeah. 70s, 
just I find so funny and that also yeah, it's quite a bizarre thought yeah it seems quite recent mm. to me anyway yeah so yeah I thought it deserved a pun definitely um okay well if you're ready let's hear it sure I just want to say hi everybody um and I wish I could see you all thanks for being here to <laughs> the poems um, Dundee Sociologists claim our quality of life peaked in 1978, the year Archie Gemmell scored a World Cup goal for Scotland. Sony invented the Walkman, Superman was playing in cinemas. That summer, my parents went into a pub, ordered two pints. We don't serve pints to ladies, the barman said. My mother did not flinch. Coolly, she asked for two halves, decanted them into a pint glass. I like to picture her, backlit by the jukebox in the pub's smoky fog, raising that tarnished gold to her lips. I love the way that you read the, we don't serve pints to ladies. There are pints to ladies. No. Oh, um, yeah, I, I love that poem. Um, and obviously, you know, set in Dundee, um, your poems in general have a real taste of Scotland. And as you say, you know, Tap Cell Theory has this a Scottish meaning. And I know one of the other poems in um, in the collection, uh, Napping, is that it? It's um, about the Shetlandic dialect. Um, so do you feel, do you, do you tend to include a lot of that Scottish side basically in your poetry? It's, it's funny, I do sometimes throw in Scots words, kind of sprinkle mm. them in because often the word I'm grasping for will come more easily to me in Scots. But my mum is from Shetland and I still have a lot of family uh, up mm -hmm. in Shetland. And Shetlandic is really a completely different dialect. It's incredibly rich and it's quite separate to Scots or to any of the dialects we have in mainland Scotland. Mm -hmm. So kind of being able to understand it, Shetlandic, but perhaps not speak it fluently, puts me in an interesting in-betweeny space. Yeah. Um, I love to kind of play around with it and, and borrow words from it. Mm -hmm. It makes for an interesting foundation for poetry. It's another layer with which you can play with words. I think so. Um, which works very well. Um, someone's just commented saying that they had the same experience um, in Ilkley in 1974. Please, so, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite appalling. I can't really imagine that being the case so recently. Yeah, um, it's shocking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah quite shocking. <laughs> um, Okay, your next poem um, is Caddy Lamb. Um, yeah, yeah. Would you, would you like to read it out? Sure. This leads on quite nicely, actually, because Caddy Lamb is the Shetlandic term for uh, just a, a wee lamb that's motherless, has been born yeah. and don't know its mother to look after it. So, mm -hmm. Caddy Lamb. Already the ewe is disappearing, ribcage strummed by the wind. She left behind a fragile legged lamb, so weak we have to bottle feed it. We approach clumsy, half afraid. My red jersey snags as I climb the fence. The milk is cold, but she guzzles it down. We both know it might be kinder to let her starve. On that peat scarred spit of land, she can have only days before the plunge of a skewer or a fox. On the way home, we say nothing about how long she will last or the growing tear in my sweater. I don't look back at the scrap of red fluttering above the pitch dark blanket of fog and turf. Beautiful. I'm, I'm must just ask, is that is it based on a real experience or is it, is it, is it not real? I definitely have bottle fed of caddy lamb as a child, mm. but I kind of took that experience and projected it into an imagined space where we have two yeah. adults, I think a couple. Yeah. And I wrote that or drafted it quite a long time ago, but I think there are probably echoes there of, of loss, maybe, you know, the loss of a child or, or a baby. And so mm. I suppose it maybe acquired a deeper resonance as yeah. time on, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, as a lot of poetry does, I think. Um, we've got a few comments that have come through. So Hannah Godden says, beautiful writing um, and a pleasure to hear you read it. Thank you 
so you're so inspiring um, which is very lovely um, and then Tom Harrison has said you may not be able to see me but I'm here applauding <laughs> Tom, thank you. <laughs> um, yes you've got some fans in the audience tonight um, okay up next is uh, your poem, The Conville Circus Vanishing Act, 1898. I think that's right. Yep. Um, yes, would you like to take it away? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. The Conville Circus Vanishing Act, 1898. It failed. The trap door opened too soon before anything was there to catch her, and she vanished for real this time, plummeting into the black with a snap. Even the tarot girls were stunned, the milky-eyed clairvoyant drawing futures from his corner, the courtesans. All were silenced, peering past dust-thickened drapes at the space where she last stood. One of the lion tamers began to weep. She was hoisted into the spotlight, which nobody had thought to turn off, and dangled there, neck broken, lipstick still intact, bright, bright in the brightness. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd say that your poetry often has a, a slightly darker, even sometimes a bit of a sinister undertone. Um, and for those of you, uh, who are watching who don't know, um, Sarah writes um, under a pseudonym, Sarah Forbes, um, for writing children's books. So do you find that you sometimes have to, you know, when you're writing, do you have to put on a different persona sometimes, depending on what sort of style you're writing? Maybe it's, maybe it's just that I have a sinister dark side. It doesn't get to <laughs> children's books. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's such a good question because I do like I, I've written three children's books under the name Sarah Forbes and they're quite kind of silly they're funny illustrated yeah. fiction for young kids um yes the poetry often goes to darker and more serious places but I think perhaps it's just um a facet of my writing I'm drawn to that in what I read as well I think mm. things are dull if they're all sweetness and light we need a little bit of a mix we need to sprinkle some salt in there yeah um, yeah, definitely. It, it just it, it creeps through. I think in my writing, I think it creeps through particularly well in this poem because obviously you know this circus idea is is so far like opposite from what it actually what the poem ends up being about. So yeah, worked very well in there. Um, I'm we'll just say that someone's commented saying um, so this is Liz Teo. Um, this was about Caddy Lamb. Um, mm -hmm. They said that was awesome. What a woman. Um, and then Sheila Sharp says, love the poem, Caddy Lamb. Mm. So. Thank you. Um, and up next we have Cluedo. Um, do you want to say a little bit about Cluedo and what inspired you to write it? Do you know what, you're just like, the clue's in the title and it's, yeah. it's a poem, it's, got, it's pretty self-explanatory. So I think mm -hmm. I'll just crack on. Yeah, okay. okay, go ahead. Cluedo. I loved its smallness, those secret corridors, that minuscule dagger, and its bigness, the body slung across the banisters, the blood pooling on the parquet floor. But most of all, I loved the resolution when justice was done and every piece slotted neatly back into the box, as if the world could be made so tidy as if we could pack any savagery so carefully away. I love that. Um, obviously you say it's quite a nifty little poem. How long would you say it usually takes you to get a poem done? I know it varies, you know, you might start a poem and then months later pick it up again. Um, but how long do you reckon it sort of usually takes you to get to the finished product? I think poets are so bad at answering this question. <laughs> McCabe famously was asked just that question how long does it take to write a poem he said twa fags two <laughs> essentially and I don't smoke so I don't I don't have that as a barometer like <laughs> I don't know I think it's it just really depends on the poem I very often we'll have mm -hmm. a snippet or an idea and uh, play with it and then come back to it but I think that um, yeah. 
yeah it's like a good stew they sort of benefit from being left for a day sometimes and sort of really mm. talk about things and and revisit them yeah yeah definitely um well fab up next we have um you ask why i seldom write about men um so uh, yeah maybe if you read this and then we can uh, i don't want to i don't want to give away the poem too much if you see what i mean so let's read through it You ask why I seldom write about men. Dear husbands, brothers, fathers, it was not my intention. I forgot to paint you in. Perhaps you exist, dead center of the canvas, busying yourself with a task in the crowd, churning milk, combing your hair. Keep looking. Is that you? Slip of pale face, deep in the twist and scar of the oils. I can't say for sure. You're at the edge of the frame, maybe, gazing outwards, your expression inscrutable, placid. Wait, there you are, lower right hand corner, arm raised as if to attract attention, obscured by the letters of my name. So when I was reading through the pamphlet, I I started to feel very aware that it was there's a very female dominated presence and then obviously I got this poem and I was like oh yes that, that is right I didn't make it up um but so why why do you think that the pamphlet ended up being that way I don't know I think for that particular poem um I quite often like to write after artworks or be inspired by artwork mm -hmm. and I read that um in 2018, 96% of the artwork sold at auction worldwide was by men. 96%. Wow. Oh my goodness, wow. Blew my mind. Yeah. So, you know, with, with no disrespect intended to all the lovely, wonderful men I know, I just felt mm -hmm. like in terms of female artists, we have a lot of ground to catch up. Um, mm -hmm. And it also kind of infuriates me the way that women are, were you know, historically just left out of literature and, you know, they, yeah, they might be there, but they'll be there combing their hair or making a cup of tea or something. Um, mm. So, yeah, I just, I guess that a bit frustration and anger propelled that poem forward. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a good motive. I feel like it, it does propel a lot of poems. <laughs> um, but I guess then it's interesting that, because I also, your your pamphlet does, um, focus on the use of memory quite a lot and looks back to old, older times um, and so I suppose that's a, a way of you doing that is you know being able to look back in the past and look back on women who might have been overlooked in that time. Sure, sure. I think generally I'm interested in um, the untold stories or you know sometimes there's a there's a text but then there's a subtext or we have a story but there's also some really interesting stuff happening over at the periphery. Mm -hmm. um, I like to investigate that and to dig into that a little bit in my in my poetry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, your um, next poem is for the mother in the crowd at I don't I don't know how you say is it She Stadium or Shea Stadium? I feel like I've heard it both ways. Good question. I'm saying Shea. I'm very happy okay. to be corrected because I'm not okay. Sure. Okay. Let me find it. Okay. For the mother in the crowd at Shea Stadium. An announcer stepped to the microphone and said, don't worry, the Beatles are here. And from that moment, nobody could hear anything but screams. The Daily News, August 16th, 1965. When the camera veers from the infield diamond, panning over the audience, you are hard to spot, outnumbered by your tear-stained daughters who clutch their faces, their hair, grab one another, in a glee that looks closer to pain. It's too hot, and they're pink-cheeked, toddler-sticky, severe, in your butterfly wing glasses, low heels, and sturdy black handbag, you have the look of a doctor, one who can dispense and restore. But they don't turn to you, do they? These long-limbed, delirious children. Your composure, your dutiful stillness, is what allows them to lurch forward, screaming, ecstatic, full of fever. 
I think that sums up quite nicely the what we were talking about before in terms of women and history and looking back. Um, I really like that poem. Um, um, someone's commented saying, I think this is in response to me asking you how long it takes you to finish a poem. Um, someone said, a watercolorist I know um, when asked the same question says, 10 minutes and lifetimes practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I have um, one more question for you. I mean, I suppose this is probably applicable to Sarah Law too, but obviously it seems like you've got a lot of different things going on. Um, and I just wondered what it is about poetry that draws you to it so much. I think it's, so just, it's quite a big question. Oh, such a big question. That's a great question. Such a different one. <laughs> I guess there's a beautiful thing about how portable poetry is. You can take poetry and carry it with you. And I don't mean just that the books are small and light. I mean that, you know, it yeah. sounds patterns, it lends itself to being remembered. Don Patterson, I think, calls the poem a little machine for remembering itself. And I love that idea that it just it's kind of generating itself, making it easy for you to take with you, to, to keep in your head or your heart. Yeah. It's so great at distilling powerful emotion as well. Mm -hmm. And it can surprise, it can be such a surprising thing. I like the surprise of poetry. Yeah, I really like that. I, I like the idea of it being portable. Um, that'll stick with me, I think. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for sharing your poetry with us. Um, I've loved listening to it and I really hope that everyone else has too, by the looks of the comments people have. Um, but I think if we bring Sarah Law back into the stream now, um, I can see you both. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say it's been so nice listening to both of your poetry. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to hear one more poem from each of you as a bit of an encore. Um, but before that, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's been involved in this. So all of you have been at home um, watching and sending in very nice questions and comments. Um, and to Paul, who's been backstage um, making magic with all the technology and pressing the buttons for us, which is very nice. Um, and to both of you for joining us this evening. So thank you very much. Um, and I will say again, if you're watching at home, then um, you can sign up to be notified about future poetry events by clicking in the link in the description. Um, and then you'll know whenever a new one comes up. Um, but OK, so Sarah Law, would you like to give us one last sparkle of your work? Uh, so much. I love the poem, Sarah. Brilliant. And I love the idea of a haunted butler as well. <laughs> <laughs> or a haunting butler. Um, right. Um, uh, shall I read As the Cat? You didn't have one set up, did um, you, Flory? We had, um, I can't remember what it was. It was the other one. Letters. The other one we had Letters. set up. Was let, me, let, me read, easier, let me read the other one then. It's called Letters. It's okay. called Letters. And it's it's from Therese. Um, and it's at the end of the book. So uh, after Therese died, um, when um, interest in her just seemed unstoppable and hundreds of letters fluttered into the convent um, asking for um, information about her or, or uh, pictures or, or any, any mementos. Mm -hmm. So letters. She comes to them in letters, a few at first like early leaves cradled through the summer's turn, their paper ivory shy, I write to you because her death, they gather tidily in her desk. Then more fly in, little birds seeking shelter. You who knew her, say a little prayer for me. Then more, with testimonies, pleas for intercession, relics, medals, something of her likeness. War comes, but still they flutter, missives from mud-spattered hearts, craving a little sweetness in the midst of dissolution. Her sisters sit in the garden, surrounded by breathing letters that nestle in the grounds of grief's castle. She is the bud and stem of them all, as they settle like petals. That's a beautiful ending. I love that very much. Thank you. Very, very lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a real treat hearing from Therese. So thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. No, thanks. Thanks yeah. very much. It's been it's been great to come and read some and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, and then the last poem that we have from Sarah Stewart, um, I believe, is it Pienza? Pienza. Yeah. Pienza, yeah. Just to make us all wish we could travel some Italy. Yes. Again, is this a is it a true story or is it unimagined? Yeah. This is, I, I've been there, it's a stunning place. I shouldn't have written a poem about it because I don't want other people to discover it. But it's yeah, <laughs> always the way. Anyway, Pienza. When we stop for a shade at a courtyard, cold mosaic tiles, baskets of jasmine. We opened water bottles and stale pasticcini. We talked about the high cup and how small the town was and how happy we were to be asked for directions on the road, though we could only say, non siamo di qui, and shrug. The air was thick with bird song, incense, and somewhere weed, and then we heard the singing, a choir, no instruments, an old crumpled priest conducting younger priests. The light seemed whiter and more radiant, falling on the graffiti and chipped ochre and blue, we froze with our lukewarm water and pastries, afraid to move in case we disturbed them. It was heaven, I'm telling you now. It was heaven and we had no idea. That's beautiful, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I have a couple more comments that I can share as well. So Barbara Stewart has said, Shea Stadium, memories triggered. Um, so she was clearly there. Um, and Laura Keating says that um, she loved both poets. She's listening in Canada, which is oh. nice to know we've got such a far reaching audience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Amanda Barton says, Thank you so much. Tuesday treat to be transported into other worlds by such beautiful poetry. Oh. So people seem to really enjoy your, your work. So thank you for sharing. Um, I have one more question. Obviously, you both you're both doing so excellently with your poetry and being published. Um, do you have any advice for any aspiring writers or people who were just beginning their poetry journey? I I would just jump in and say, just go for it. I I think it's so easy to be stymied or freaked out by the idea of writing poetry, but mm. free verse, no need to worry about rhyming. Just go for it. But also for me, finding an evening class and like some like-minded people who also were trying and learning was crucial. So I think if you can get to one even online, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree, hundred percent. I mean, you learn you learn to write by. So, so write, write freely and free associate and play with language and play with the sounds of language and just don't, don't worry at all. And yes, and, and making, making contact with some people um, can offset the, the sort of the strange loneliness that, <laughs> that, that writing sometimes mm -hmm. involves and, and is enjoyable in itself, but <laughs> get the balance. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, well, fantastic. Um, thank you again for um, joining us. And thank you to everyone who's been watching from home. Um, so wonderful. Um, goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you.